In sports, as in business, making a commitment to excellence is the first step on the road to success. It's a commitment made by William Dillard when he opened his first store, a commitment that is honored by all Dillard's associates today. It's a commitment made by LSU's first football team, a commitment handed down through generations of young athletes. To acknowledge this commitment, Dillard's Department Stores is proud to sponsor this video commemorating 100 years of Tiger football. The legend and lore of LSU football defines the state of Louisiana as much as the Mississippi. New Orleans are the sweet smell of Cajun cooking. The rockin' Saturday nights in the bayou. Chinese bandits. The south end zone. Halloween nights. They're all a part of LSU football. But more important are the coaches and athletes that created this tradition and gave it meaning. The men who dedicated their lives to LSU football. They are the Golden Tigers. Throws, sets up, puts it out there, and it's complete, and it is a touchdown! Hi, I'm Ron Franklin. You know, for generations, the stars have come out in Tiger Stadium on Saturday nights. And as a result, Tiger fans have been treated to some of the best football in the history of the game. And you know, it really doesn't matter if you're talking about current day names like Tommy Hodson or Gary James or Dalton Hilliard, or if you want to go back and talk about some of the legends, Y.A. Tittle or Coach Paul Dietzel or maybe Billy Cannon. All were involved in great victories here, but most importantly, all set standards in character and courage that is simply unmatched. In 1893, Louisiana State University was home for approximately 200 students, none of whom had ever heard of football. But at the beginning of the fall semester, that would change forever. A young chemistry professor named Dr. Charles Coates had recently arrived from up north and was dismayed to learn LSU had no team. Intent on introducing the game to his new colleagues, he shanghaied 27 players from the student body. He nailed cleats onto leather shoes and created uniforms and football was born on the bayou. But it wasn't until the early 1900s the Tigers' first star emerged. He was Doc Fenton an extremely versatile athlete who had been recruited from Pennsylvania to play for LSU. A testament to his ability came from LSU President Troy Middleton, who said, I saw Jim Thorpe, but Doc Fenton was better. In 1907, Fenton and his teammates made a memorable trip to Cuba, embarrassing the University of Havana 56 to nothing. Then in 1908, Doc led LSU to a perfect 10-0 season. He scored 25 touchdowns and kicked six field goals that remarkable year, including a 46-yarder that was LSU's longest until 1965. After Fenton and his teammates moved on, LSU fans had little to cheer about for nearly two decades. Finally, in 1923, LSU talked Auburn coaching legend Mike Donahue into coming to Baton Rouge to put the LSU Tigers back on the map. He would lead the Tigers to a winning record the very next season. More importantly, on Thanksgiving Day, 1924, 
LSU fans witnessed the dedication of Tiger Stadium. A record 18,000 fans crammed the brand new facility that day. And although the Tigers lost 13 to nothing to Tulane, the day marked the start of big time college football at LSU. While Mike Donahue never matched his previous success at Auburn, he did build a solid foundation for success at LSU. In the 1930s, Tiger fans reaped the rewards. Recruits like Baby Jack Torrance arrived in 1931. At 6'4", 265 pounds, he was an imposing figure even at today's standards. LSU joined the fledgling SEC in 1933 and instantly became one of the new conference's elite teams. At the same time, Abe Michael and Jesse Fothery teamed up in one of the most explosive backfields in LSU history. Fothery was noted for his speed and cutting ability, which allowed him to make some of the longest touchdown runs in school history while future Hall of Famer Abe Michael was especially adept at throwing the long bomb. In his final game, Michael accounted for three touchdowns in a 41 to nothing victory over Tulane to clinch the 1935 SEC title. But it was a teammate of Michael's from Homer, Louisiana, named Gaynell Tinsley that would make the most lasting contribution to LSU football. Gus, as he was known, was a devastating blocker and sure-handed receiver. He became a two-time All-American who today is still considered to be one of the finest athletes in LSU history. Tensley's 1936 team won a second straight SEC title and earned the number two ranking in the brand new AP Top 20 poll. The 30s saw one more All-American emerge at LSU. He was in Ken Kavanaugh, one of the most devastating ends in the history of LSU football. His catch against Santa Clara in the 1938 Sugar Bowl was a highlight of the first LSU bowl game ever to be captured on motion picture film. man who had perhaps the greatest impact on LSU and football in those days was not a player or a coach. He was the Tigers' number one fan, Louisiana Governor Huey Long. Once, he arranged for free train fare for the student body to travel to an away game. After Abe Michael had led the Tigers to the 1935 SEC title, Long had him made a state senator. He loved the band and took pride in building the Tiger Band into one of the nation's finest. He even helped write the LSU fight song. The Kingfish, as he was known, was a bigger-than-life figure whose exploits may seem a little outrageous today, but he loved LSU football with a passion that can still be felt today on the campus at LSU. Governor Huey Long was LSU's biggest fan, without question. He loved his Tiger football team, and he wanted to see them dominate the college football world. He tried to help recruit. He praised them. He even sent in plays from the sideline. And when an assassin's bullet took his life here at the state capitol in Baton Rouge, one source was quoted as saying, it is a wonder he didn't bleed purple and gold. In the 1940s, LSU football obtained greater national visibility, thanks in large part to the heroics of several young men who would eventually become superstars in the NFL and Major League Baseball. The legendary Alvin Dark scored a touchdown the very first time he touched the ball for LSU, and that was in 1942. But his career was cut short by World War II. After the war, a staggering $40,000 offer to play baseball took him far from the campus at Baton Rouge. 
The moving van, Steve Van Buren, began his LSU career as a blocking back. But by his senior year, he was all SEC and wound up his career as the MVP of the Tigers' 1944 Orange Bowl victory over Texas. Another future NFL Hall of Famer came to the LSU campus in 1946, almost directly from the University of Texas athletic dorm. Somehow, LSU assistant Red Swanson convinced the 17-year-old Y.A. Tittle that he'd be better off on the banks of the Mississippi. Y.A. Tittle had agreed to come to LSU and wanted to come to LSU. And uh, just before I, I was supposed to pick him up at his home in Marshall, Texas, well, Texas had taken him down to the University of Texas. And I went down uh, that night and got in, went over to the dormitory and got a hold of him and got him out of town that night because we were afraid that the Texas Rangers would get after us if we didn't get on out of the state uh, before daylight. Yelberton Abraham Tittle played quarterback like no one before him, practically rewriting the LSU passing record book. He took special delight in beating Tulane, which had never offered him a scholarship, and where his older brother Jack had played football. He never lost to the Green Wave. In four games against the Greenies, he completed 42 of 56 passes for eight touchdowns. The 1950s brought about a new era in college football. In 1954, Tiger Stadium was expanded. It took on the bowl look for the first time and seated an astounding number of 67,500 fans. LSU was on the verge of the golden era of Tiger football. In 1956, a young coach named Paul Dietzel was hired to rebuild the program. He quickly assembled one of the most talented coaching staffs in the South, which included future LSU athletic director Carl Maddox and future head coach Charlie McClendon. The Tigers started 0-6 in 1956 but turned things around when an inexperienced fullback named Jim Taylor was inserted into the lineup. LSU won three out of the last four games behind the power running of Taylor. In 1957, he enjoyed his finest year as a Tiger, leading the conference in rushing and touchdowns. Being on scholarship here at LSU certainly meant a lot to me and gave me the opportunity to get a, a college degree and to, to work uh, on my skills as a professional uh, and to try and become a professional football player. So I was certainly delighted to be given the opportunity here at LSU to, uh, to go on and further my uh, football skills at the professional level. Taylor did just that, becoming an NFL Hall of Fame fullback for the legendary Green Bay Packers. With the departure of Taylor, one of the most loved athletes in LSU history, Billy Cannon, took center stage. He was the SEC's Player of the Year in 1958, leading the Tigers to their only national championship. An especially gifted athlete, he was also the SEC Sprint and Shot Put champion. On the gridiron, in addition to his offensive skills, he was a tenacious tackler and a heck of a kicker. At one point in his career, LSU won 19 straight games, by far the most successful era in school history. Billy loved LSU, and LSU loved Billy. He added a whole new dimension to the Saturday night hysteria called Tiger football. It seemed as if each week, Cannon would pull off a daring run even more breathtaking than his last.
Finally, in a 1959 showdown against Ole Miss, Cannon etched his name into the LSU history books with a feat of mythical proportions. With the Tigers trailing the Rebels 3-0 in the fourth quarter, Cannon pulled off the most famous Halloween stunt in the history of college football. Ole Miss, he stands on his own 28. He gets a pass from center. He boots it and gets another nice kick away going way downfield. Billy Cannon watches it bounce. He takes it on his own 11. He comes back upfield at the 15. Stumbles momentarily. He's at the 20. Running hard at the 25. Gets away from one man for 30. Still runs the 25. some 89 yards for a touchdown. Listen to the cheer for Billy Cannon as he comes off the field. Great All-American. I said, if I get a chance, I'm going to take this one up the field. And I got a great bounce. And it came right to me, which just happened to be on the 11-yard line. But uh, got, a, got a few breaks, got some great blocks. Uh, Emil Fournette took three right off my back. And uh, it was up to just the punter and I. And I'm sure he thought I was going to cut back to the open field and I cut to the sidelines. And Jake Gibbs never made a tackle in his whole career at uh, Ole Miss. He was, he was their quarterback and punter. And uh, so I, I went by him and then it was a touch and go as to whether the game was going to finish or I was going to score. <laughs> so. Tiger fans already knew that Billy Cannon was the finest football player in America. At the season's end, it was made official. Billy won the Heisman Trophy and brought it home to Baton Rouge. The 1958 championship team was loaded with talent. Halfback Johnny Robinson would have been a superstar on any other team. He alone scored four touchdowns in LSU's 62 to nothing trouncing of Tulane that year. An all-SEC quarterback, Warren Rabb had the ability to maximize the talents of Cannon and Robinson while contributing himself both in the air and on the ground. And kicker Tommy Davis may have been the unsung hero of 1958. His kicks against Florida and Mississippi State kept the Tigers' unbeaten streak alive. And center linebacker Max Fugler was the backbone of a defense that allowed just 82 points in 21 games during the 58 and 59 seasons. It was that defense that ensured a national championship in 1958. When Cannon and Robinson moved on, Coach Dietzel announced that a sophomore from West Monroe, Louisiana, named Jerry Stovall, would be their equal. He indeed became the player Dietzel predicted. In 1960, Stovall began a relationship with LSU fans that would last for three decades. In his final two seasons, Stovall led the Tigers to a 19-2-1 record, including an Orange Bowl route of Colorado and a Cotton Bowl shutout of Darrell Royal's undefeated Texas Longhorns. By the time his career ended, he was a unanimous All-American, runner-up for the Heisman Trophy and SEC Player of the Year in 1962. You could honestly say that no one ever gave more to LSU than Jerry Stovall. While LSU running backs grabbed the headlines, much of the attention and credit should have gone actually to the men up front of the trenches. You see, over the years, LSU has been blessed with some truly outstanding offensive linemen. And two of the best the SEC has ever known set up shop right here in Baton Rouge in the early 1960s. Charles Bo Strange was a three-time All-SEC performer and an All-American in 1960. Following him was Roy Mooney Winston, number 60. 
a Baton Rouge native, and another consensus All-American. He went on to play in four Super Bowls with the Minnesota Vikings. Perhaps the finest lineman in the SEC at that time was All-American tackle Fred Miller. He was a crushing force on both sides of the ball. But his teammates remember him most for the night he crawled out of a hospital bed and led the Tigers to victory. Fred was uh, in the infirmary, uh, in back traction, and we were getting ready to play te uh, Texas A&M on a Saturday night. He wasn't supposed to play. He got up and checked himself out and uh, came and played. And on the first play defensively, uh, broke through, made a tackle behind the line of scrimmage. And I think that kind of set the tone for everything that was going to happen. And then, of course, his brilliant career in professionals kind of, kind of put a crown on everything else. But he was an incredible leader for us. Although these legends are remembered primarily as an offensive player or a defensive player, all played both ways, sometimes in the most miserable conditions. As the 60s arrived, the times were changing. Soon these days of playing 60 minutes would be gone forever. But the deeds of these brave warriors would live on in the hearts of LSU fans forever. In the mid-1930s, LSU began what would be one of the most successful eras in its history. Again, Huey Long was center stage. The Kingfish was personally involved in the selection of the new football coach. And it was only after his approval that Bernie Moore, already a member of the LSU staff, was appointed head coach. It turned out to be one of the best decisions in LSU history. The Tigers won back-to-back -back SEC titles in 1935 and 36. Moore went on to win 83 games in 13 seasons, becoming the second winningest coach in LSU history. Under Bernie Moore, LSU became one of the most dominant teams in the conference, but he left to become the SEC's first full-time commissioner. His successor, former LSU All-American Gaynell Tinsley, led the 1949 team that became known as the Cinderella Tigers. It was a team destined to whip three conference champions and earn a spot in the 1950 Sugar Bowl. They did have a good bit of talent, but they had more pride and uh, great respect for being able to play for LSU. And I think their effort that they gave had more to do with it than anything else. He also developed a unique numbering system for players using both letters and numerals. It was experimented with for one season, but never caught on. In 1955, a young assistant coach from Army named Paul Dietzel was hired to take the Tigers back to the top of the SEC. In three years, the Tigers were not only SEC champs, they were an undefeated national champion as well. Dietzel was a promoter, cheerleader, and college football innovator all rolled into one. Before the 1958 season, he changed the offense to the wing tee, suiting the talents of quarterback Warren Rabb and backs Johnny Robinson and Billy Cannon perfectly. Due to the depth of the talent he had on offense, Dietzel divided the players into the white team and the gold team. Due to a newspaper account's misprint, however, the gold team quickly became known as the go team. It was the defense, however, that Dietzel gave perhaps the most enduring nickname. He called it the Chinese Bandits after seeing a Terry and the Pirates comic strip referred to a Chinese bandit as the most ferocious creature on Earth. In 1958, the bandits more than lived up to their nickname. 
They held opponents to seven points or less in 10 of the 11 games that season. 1958 was truly a very special year. Oh, it was a, a, a Cinderella year. It was a great year. Everything just jailed. And, you know, we were winning games, but nobody was really on our bandwagon. And we went down and played uh, the University of Miami, which all the Eastern sports writers came down for that game, and we beat them handily. And from then on, everything was on our wagon, and the wagon just kept rolling and rolling, and it was a great year. In 1959, the Tigers were bowl-bound again, but it was the 61 SEC championship team that Dietzel called his finest. After an opening day loss to Rice, this squad won 10 straight, including a 25-7 triumph over Colorado in the Orange Bowl. Then came the almost unthinkable news. At the height of his career, Paul Dietzel announced he was leaving LSU to coach at his beloved West Point. LSU fans were shocked and hurt. Into this tension-packed situation stepped Charlie McClendon. A former Dietzel assistant, McClendon wasn't a salesman like his predecessor. Charlie Mack was a straightforward defensive coach, a trait he learned from his mentor, Bear Bryant. What you saw with Charlie Mack, well, that's what you got. And what you got was two decades of winning football. In his first season, despite the pressure of replacing the beloved Dietzel, the Tigers went 9-1-1 one and, one and shut out Texas 13-0 in the Cotton Bowl. He had perhaps his finest season in 1969. The Tigers went 9-1 behind a great defense led by linebacker George Bevan and the arrival of a pair of sophomores named Tommy Casanova and Andy Hamilton. Ironically, LSU stayed home at New Year's after being shut out of the major bowls. The following season, the Tigers had their revenge. LSU was the champion of the SEC, and Charlie Mack was named College Football's Coach of the Year. During his tenure, McClendon produced 17 All-Americans, and the Tigers won nearly 70% of their games. Nineteen eighty was a time to begin anew. A young man by the name of Bo Ryan was hired as the head coach. He had great credentials, and it appeared as though LSU would maintain consistency in a league that had become the most competitive in the country. But tragically, in January, Bo Ryan died in a plane crash. The new era simply never began. Bo Ryan never coached a football game at LSU. Jerry Stovall, LSU's former All-American running back, had the unenviable task of taking over as head coach. At this time, more than any other, it was perhaps more important that the program was in the hands of a member of the LSU family. Stovall gave the program character and stability. In 1982, he was named National Coach of the Year after guiding the Tigers to a berth in the Orange Bowl. In 1984, Bill Arnsbarger was appointed head coach. His experience led the Tigers to three straight winning seasons and an SEC championship in 1986. Arnsbarger's defensive assistant, Mike Archer, followed in his footsteps and produced an SEC title of his own as head coach in 1988. In 
In 1990, Curly Hallman became the 28th head coach of LSU football. Before coming to Baton Rouge, Hallman had directed Southern Mississippi to two bowl games in three years. He now leads LSU into its second century. These men have created a tradition of excellence that has made LSU one of the winningest football programs in NCAA history. More importantly, they have produced young men who are winners both on and off the field. During the 1960s, college football truly came of age. National television exposure thrust the game into the media spotlight. With LSU's consistency of success, the Tigers were becoming famous far beyond the bayou. LSU receiver Doug Morrow grabbed the attention of the nation by earning All-American honors in 1965. On January the 1st, his receiving and kicking led the Bengals to a stunning 13-10 victory in the Sugar Bowl over Floyd Little's highly touted Syracuse team. While offense grabbed the headlines, it was defense that would become the trademark of Coach Charlie McClendon's Tiger teams of the 60s and the early 70s. McClendon's first defensive All-American was John Garlington a fast, tough defensive end who had a nose for the football. In 1969 and 1970, LSU fielded the most tenacious defense in the country. Both years, the Tigers led the nation in rushing defense. Two homegrown stars, linebackers Mike Anderson and George Bevan, provided the heart and soul of the unit. Bevan overcame a severe knee injury in his junior year to become an All-American in 1969. His legendary blocked extra point against Auburn that season preserved a hard-fought 21-20 victory over the other Tigers. Mike Anderson was simply the most feared linebacker in America in 1969 and 1970. And despite battling a series of knee injuries, Anderson consistently made the big play. In 1970, his fourth down hit on Auburn's Wallace Clark climaxed a dramatic goal line stand and enabled the Tigers to win a 17-9 heartstopper, a victory that served as the catalyst for the Bengals' SEC title run. You visualize on your players some of the big plays that they made for you. And, and Mike Allison stood about as tall as any young man that ever put the uniform on down in Auburn. When he stopped Clark, I believe his name was, the fullback down there, stopped him on the one yard line, right in the breast button and put him back. That was the difference in the ball game. Up front on the defensive line, the Tigers were just as ferocious. In 1971, they were led by tackle Ron Este. He simply had a nose for the quarterback. His speed and quickness earned him All-America, as well as Lineman of the Year honors from ABC Sports. But perhaps the most famous defender of that era was a defensive back from Crowley, Louisiana, named Tommy Casanova. He began his career on offense but he made his mark in the defensive secondary. In 1971, he brought tears to Irish eyes with an interception in the end zone in the Tigers' 28-8 thrashing of Notre Dame. This three-time All-American and member of the all-time SEC team 
also returned punts for the Tigers and ran back two for touchdowns in LSU's 1970 victory over Ole Miss. Although LSU defenses were leading the nation in the early 70s, a young quarterback with an arm like a rifle quickly grabbed the headlines. He was Burt Jones, the son of an NFL star named Dub Jones. Known as the Rustin Rifle, Jones became LSU's first and only All-American quarterback. He was a player that broke the mold for the college quarterback. Jones could throw a 70-yard bomb as easily as a 15-yard out. He also possessed the speed of a running back and the hard-nosed attitude of a middle linebacker. His favorite target during the 71 season was his first cousin, Andy Hamilton, an all-SEC performer who at that time was LSU's all-time leading receiver. Best of all, Burt Jones was a fearless competitor who seemed to play his best with the game on the line. He was fortunate to be surrounded by several other All-Americans. Tyler LaFosse was a tough defensive lineman, but earned All-American status when he moved to the other side of the ball. All-American linebacker Warren Capone, number 55, won team MVP honors in 1973. In 1971, Capone showed that he had some of the qualities that made his distant cousin Al so famous by swiping two Notre Dame passes to thwart Irish scoring drives. Mike Williams was another defensive star in the mid-70s. The whole country witnessed his stamina and courage in a game against Florida in 1972. Playing in a driving rainstorm, Williams caught Gator speedster Nat Moore from behind to save an apparent Florida touchdown. In 1976, Charlie McClendon unleashed a one-in-a-million talent on the SEC named A.J. Dewey. One of the few four-year starters in LSU history, Dewey had amazing speed and quickness for a defensive tackle. While Burt Jones redefined the quarterback position at LSU, it was Charles Alexander that created a new breed of running back in the Bayou. As a two-time All-American in 1977 and 78, he broke 29 different LSU records, several of which have never been broken. And his 237 yards against Oregon in 1977 still ranks as the finest single game performance by an LSU back. Like most great backs, he still gives most credit for his success to the men in the trenches, the Root Hawks. You know, it all starts up front. Uh... A running back is only as good as the blockers in front of him. And I, I know I got a lot of the credit, but those guys did all the work. One of Alexander's backfield mates was a rough, tough competitor named Hokey Gaijan. As a member of the New Orleans Saints, he continued the Bengal tradition of running backs who had gained acclaim in the National Football League. In 1982, two freshman running backs arrived in Baton Rouge and immediately turned the town upside down. That's Hilliard. He'll score. He'll score. Dalton Hilliard, the first play on offense, and LSU has a 6 to nothing lead. Fisher, pitch. Gary James. Gary James. He's free at the 40. He's got one man to beat. One man to beat. Touchdown! Touchdown, Gary James! They were Dalton Hilliard and Gary James. The Dalton James Gang for short. They instantly captured the imagination of Tiger fans while terrorizing opposing defenses. 
uh, after our freshman had come in, Daryl Moody, who was a running back coach, came to me and he, after about three days, and he said, I think we may have a problem. The guys that we have listed next to last and last on our depth chart may wind up to be the very best that we've got. And uh, then our freshman uh, got ready and the varsity came in, and that came to be true. And they, they added a dimension to us we had not had before. And it was incredible that we were calling the same plays we'd called in the past, but they were working a little bit better. And just sheer God-given talent, tremendous character by the individuals, but I think they were basically the missing ingredients. The running exploits of the Dalton James gang would have been impossible without an All-American offensive tackle named Lance Smith to lead the way. Following the 6'2", 273-pound Smith, Hilliard and James accumulated more rushing and receiving yardage than any other duo in the history of the SEC. Gary James, with his 4-3 speed, complemented Dalton Hilliard perfectly. Hilliard ended his career as both the leading scorer and all-time leading rusher in LSU history. The running of the Dalton James gang opened up an explosive aerial attack led by quarterback Alan Risher and All-American receiver Eric Martin. In 1982, the averaged their average three points per game. That's the most in LSU history. The 1982 defense did its fair share, too. Led by All-American defensive back James Britt and safety Lifford Hobley, nine members of the starting unit went on to play pro football. Britt was an enemy quarterback's biggest nightmare. One of Britt's big hits or interceptions short-circuited many scoring opportunities. The 1982 defensive MVP, Lifford Hoblin, would go on to become All-SEC in both 83 and 84. As a senior, his 80 tackles and six interceptions led the Tigers to a berth in the 1985 Orange Bowl. In 1986, Tiger fans witnessed the emergence of another offensive juggernaut. This lethal combination was composed of quarterback Tommy Hodson and wide receiver Wendell Davis. Together, they became the most productive passing combination in SEC history. What they did went far beyond statistics. Watching them at their best, one realized this was the work of two accomplished masters. Drops back to throw, sets up, puts it out there, and it's complete! And it is a touchdown! <laughs> Freshman running back Harvey Williams took advantage of the focus on Hodson and Davis and Harris opposing defenses in his own explosive style. The team captain in 1986 was all SEC guard Eric Andelsack. His work up front was instrumental in the success of Hodson, Davis, and Williams. He would have gone on to become an All-Pro in the NFL, but was tragically killed in 1992 when he was struck by a truck in front of his Thibodeau home. The 1986 squad would win LSU's first SEC title under coach Bill Arnsbarger. You knew that with Arnsbarger, the defense would be suffocating. Henry Thomas, Carl Wilson, and Michael Brooks led one of the SEC's most feared units. In 
As the 80s came to a close, LSU would produce several more All-Americans. Defensive back Greg Jackson. Center Nacho Albergamo. And receiver Todd Kenshin. Kenshin was a threat as a receiver and a kick returner. And his thrilling touchdown run against Texas A&M in 1990 was still another moment that rocks Death Valley on Saturday night. Trying to come outside, gets by one man, has the first down, still on his feet, coming down on your sideline. He may go 45-40, he's at the 35-30, he may The decades change, but the thrill remains the same. From the pioneers to these modern day heroes, they've all shared in the dream to play for LSU. They played in Tiger Stadium, heard the wild cheers on Saturday nights in Baton Rouge, and earned a place in the hearts of Tiger fans forever. When you come to Tiger Stadium, you can almost feel the presence of the men whose deeds are responsible for the lore and the legend of LSU football. From Doc Fenton to Paul Dietzel, Burt Jones, Dalton Hillier, and the hundreds of other young men who wore the purple and gold, there has been a common bond. Each one has played for the pride of LSU and for all the people of Louisiana. They are the Golden Tigers have created a tradition of excellence and a fighting spirit that is unique in college football. college football there is no other setting that can match that of Tiger Stadium in Baton Rouge the noise the hot sticky humidity of the Louisiana Bayou and the ghost of LSU legends all torment Tiger opponents for them this place so dear to Tiger fans indeed does become Death Valley. For 100 years, LSU fans have witnessed countless magic moments. Many that have defined the very essence of college football. Billy Cannon watches it bounce, he takes it on his own 11, he comes back up field at the 15, stumbles momentarily, he's at the 20, running hard at the 25, gets away from one man to the 30, still runs at 25. The game over, Jones back to throw, looking for a receiver, he has Davis, it is good! LSU has been blessed with a century of success. It has been filled with moments of great courage and unwavering character that resulted in hundreds of breathtaking victories. These are golden moments in Tiger Land. Hi, 
I'm Ron Franklin. You know, over the years, I've had the good fortune to witness a number of big LSU ball games, many of them right here in the stadium. And probably the thought that I would take away every time I had been here was that the mortar and that the steel in this old stadium is still reverberating from some of those nighttime clashes before sellout crowds. But I think if we were silent right now, and there was one echo that would be remembered by not only me, but everybody in this Bayou State, we'd go back to Halloween night, 1959. It was a showdown between two undefeated SEC powerhouses and two very bitter rivals, LSU and the Ole Miss Rebels. Tickets were at such a premium in the 67,500 seat stadium that one man offered a used Cadillac for four seats. One guy even ventured to swap his wife. LSU was ranked number one, Ole Miss number three. Each team had allowed only one touchdown in the seven previous games of 1959. Ole Miss managed a field goal in the first quarter, but both defenses were suffocating. It appeared that neither team was destined to score a six-pointer that all hallows Eve. That's when Billy Cannon took destiny into his own hands. Ole Miss, he stands on his own 28. He gets a pass from center, he boots it and gets another nice kick away going way downfield. Billy Cannon watches it bounce, he takes it on his own 11, he comes back upfield at the 15, stumbles momentarily, he's at the 20, running hard at the 25, gets away from one man for 30, still runs at the 25, at the 35, the 25, he's down to 50, he's in the 50, 45, 40. In the 75, he scores! Billy Cannon raced some 89 yards for a touchdown. Listen to the cheer for Billy Cannon as he comes off the field. Great all America! The run gave the Tigers six points and the victory. It also helped Billy Cannon lock up the Heisman Trophy. If there's one play that symbolizes the spirit of LSU football, it's the punt return where a cannon streaked across the field. LSU led seven to three but many have forgotten that there were still 10 minutes remaining in the game. Ultimately, a dramatic goal line stand saved the game for the Tigers. On fourth down, Ole Miss was about to score, when who else but Billy Cannon made the hit that assured an LSU victory. Although the Halloween Night Classic of 1959 is perhaps the most famous game in LSU history, it was certainly not the Tigers' first golden moment. In 1893, the Bengals began their first and longest lasting rivalry by meeting Tulane in the first game in the history of LSU football. Over the years, these two foes have battled over recruits, bragging rights, and national recognition. But in 1937, they battled over a pair of pants. You see, at the game's coin toss, LSU halfback Pinky Rome made an agreement with the Tulane captain. The winner of the game would cut the seat out of the opposing captain's pants. After the 20 to nothing Tiger victory, Rome made good on the bet. He snipped the pants, and a tradition was born. This evolved into the rag, a flag decorated with both LSU's and Tulane's colors. The whereabouts of the rag today are unknown. The tradition of night football in Baton Rouge got its start on October the 3rd, 1931. In the first game ever played under the lights, LSU defeated Spring Hill 35 to nothing the strength of the running of halfback Art Foley. Ironically, it was the only game Foley ever played for the Tigers. It wasn't easy playing football in those days. Even bowl games were played in miserable conditions. In 
In 1947, LSU would meet Arkansas in the Cotton Bowl. In truth, it was more of an ice bowl. The ground was frozen. You couldn't even stand up. It was so cold when we weren't playing, uh, we took the benches and set them afire and tried to keep warm. We ran out of benches and fortunately the game ended. The 1949 Cinderella Tigers charmed fans like no other LSU team before or since as they defeated three conference champions on their way to the Sugar Bowl. Two games that year have come to symbolize that magical season. LSU coach Gaynell Tinsley played a key role in the famous wet field game against North Carolina. One of the men that kept the, did the field, one of the people who worked on the field, he had gone home and didn't we always, in the summertime, we would wet the field in the night before so it would be fine for the ball game, just a good sprinkle. Well, he was, wasn't here that night, he was sick or something, was home, so I asked my manager to go out and water the field after the, they practice that night, after we practice, and he did. The next morning when I get to the stadium about 7 o'clock or 7.30, the man, the caretaker, was out re-watering the field, not knowing that it had been watered the night before. By the way, LSU beat North Carolina 13 to 7. The regular season wrapped up with the annual showdown against Tulane. The night before the game, some Tiger fans painted their prediction on the Tulane Stadium. LSU 21, Tulane nothing. It seemed ridiculous. Tulane had shut out the Tigers the year before. But the next day, in front of a record crowd of 79,000, LSU pulled the upset of the season. Kenny Conch was the hero, taking a punt back 92 yards for a touchdown. It proved to be the catalyst for, you guessed it, a 21 to nothing victory. Tulane read the writing on the wall. The love affair between this team and its fans has always been very clear-cut. Devotion and undying affection. But the relationship between the head coach and the fans, well, it hasn't always been that clear-cut. Paul Dietzel arrived in Baton Rouge in 1954 and led the Tigers to their only national championship. But the simple promise he made to never leave LSU got him in trouble with the fans. 1958 would be Dietzel's finest season. At Alabama, the Crimson Tide controlled the game for nearly a half, but the Tigers were undaunted. Johnny Robinson's TD reception finally put the Tigers in front. Then Billy Cannon scored to put the finishing touches on a 13-3 victory. After the game, even Bear Bryant admitted that team was special. Later that year, Ole Miss came to Baton Rouge, ranked number one in the nation. It would be the first sellout of the expanded Tiger Stadium. An incredible first quarter goal line stand at the south end zone set the tone for the contest. Touchdowns by white team quarterback Warren Rabb and go teamer Durrell Mathern gave the Tigers a 14 to nothing win. LSU's most lopsided win that magical year came in New Orleans in a 62 to nothing romp over Tulane. The game was just six to nothing at the half but the Tigers flexed their muscle and scored eight touchdowns in the final 30 minutes. They finished the season undefeated. 
The national title was LSU's, and Dietzel's three-team scheme had captured the country's imagination. The Tigers were number one. But there was one game left to play. It was on New Year's Day in New Orleans. The Tigers wanted something that day that had eluded LSU teams before, a victory in the Sugar Bowl. Thanks to their great defense and a Billy Cannon nine-yard option pass to Mickey Mangum, they got it, a seven to nothing shutout of Clemson. The play was a halfback pass, which Billy threw, which I had somewhat of a nickname of Iron Hands. Uh, fortunately, I caught it. I'm not sure I caught it with my hands or my elbows, but it was a uh, halfback option pass, and it was open, and he hit me in the end zone, and, and uh, it worked well. Though there was no repeat title, Two of the next three years, the Tigers were bowl bound. And Coach Paul Dietzel called the 1961 team one of his finest. This team won Dietzel's second SEC title and a trip to the Orange Bowl. After a rugged 10 to seven victory over Ole Miss that year, he talked about the quality of the 61 squad. I hope all the boys that played on our championship team in 1958 and 59 will forgive me for this statement. But I want you to know that's the greatest victory I think I've ever participated in. I have never been so thrilled about a win or so thrilled with a great bunch of boys as I was tonight. I think they're the most courageous bunch. Uh, it's just un unbelievable how much courage they showed out there tonight. But there was trouble on the home front. Five days after a thorough dismantling of Colorado in the 62 Orange Bowl, Dietzel asked out of his contract and headed to Army as head coach. He had broken his promise to the fans of LSU. In Dietzel's place was former defensive assistant Charlie McClendon. The coaching style changed, but the winning ways continued. In 1962, the Tigers roared to a 9-1-1 record. The highlight of the year came in Atlanta against a powerful Georgia Tech squad. To start the second half, Jerry Stovall took the kickoff, faked to Jimmy Field, and headed upfield untouched for a 98-yard kickoff return, all with a broken rib. See, now the person touched me. I didn't have to over, you know, overpower anybody. When you knock that many people down and they give you a hole to run through, then that's, that's much easier. Real fortunate, though, we play on the American field, because if they'd been 110, 120 yards long, wouldn't have been a touchdown. They'd have caught me. <laughs> With the score tied at seven, backup quarterback Lynn Amity drove the Tigers to a winning field goal and kicked it himself. The Tigers claimed a 10-7 victory. In 1964, the Rebs and the Tigers teamed up for another Halloween night thriller. Ole Miss had dominated until the game's final moments, when an LSU touchdown and a two-point conversion pulled out a narrow 11-10 triumph. It was Charlie Mack's first victory over the Tigers' arch rival. McClendon had been a Dietzel's shadow as an assistant. But even after taking over, there were the inevitable comparisons. After all, Dietzel had won a national championship. McClendon would call the 1966 opener against South Carolina his biggest game. It marked the return of Dietzel, now head coach for the Gamecocks. Charlie Mack sorely wanted to win this one, as it turned out, the game never lived up to its hype. LSU won it easily, 28 to 12. 
Perhaps an even tougher assignment awaited the Tigers when they arrived in Dallas for the 1966 Cotton Bowl. In an unlikely matchup, Charlie Mack and the 7-3 Tigers went up against number two ranked Arkansas. Super salesman athletic director Jim Corbett had convinced somebody in Dallas at the Cotton Bowl that the 7-3 Tigers should be invited on New Year's Day to take on the unbeaten and second ranked Arkansas Razorbacks. Well, Arkansas had won 22 in a row, and as you might imagine, they were very, very heavy favorites. Coach Charlie McClendon remembers that matchup. Well, the height was really kind of unusual. You know, here, they'd won 22 straight ball games, and we came up with the idea that, okay, we bought all red jerseys with white numerals on them and to be victim number 23. So I kind of, for two weeks, I put it to our players, you're victim number 23. They got so sick of seeing 23. <laughs> but there were some big plays that were made for that ball game that uh, uh, really made the big difference. And uh, I've always felt like you have to have some big plays. But I think a couple of ladies from Arkansas kind of helped us out when they came in with their red and white uh, uniforms on and said, well, they did show up. Well, you know, that kind of fired the players up. In fact, that's all I said when we got ready to hit the field. I said, well, I think those ladies said it all. You know, we did show up, so that was good. The Tigers showed up, but it was the Hogs who were led to the slaughter. In the second quarter, little Joe Labruzzo carried five times on a seven-play scoring drive. Moments later, Bill Bass recovered a Razorback fumble, and the same scoring script evolved. It was Labruzzo again, taking it in for the score. In the fourth quarter, Jerry Joseph grabbed an interception, and victory was assured. LSU had triumphed 14 to 7 in one of the biggest upsets in bowl history. One of the most remarkable series in LSU football came not against a traditional foe like Tulane or another SEC powerhouse. It was the Tigers matchup with the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame. The series began in 1970 when the Tigers traveled to South Bend to take on a Joe Theismann-led squad. LSU's defense set the tone for this day. On the first play of the game, linebacker Richard Piku promptly separated the football from the receiver. It gave the Irish an early wake-up call. Then Piku caused another fumble and recovered it with the Irish threatened on the Tiger three. Later, with Notre Dame facing fourth and inches near midfield, the defense held again. Although the Tigers eventually lost three to nothing, the game marked the birth of a terrific rivalry. In 1970, the three to nothing loss to Notre Dame was excruciatingly painful, but yet the Tigers went on to win their only SEC championship under Charlie Mack. A key victory took place on a wet, sloppy day at Auburn. LSU was a 13 point underdog to Pat Sullivan and the Tigers. the Bayou Bengals would not be intimidated. The offense put two touchdowns on the board, and the defense, led by All-American Ron Este. Linebacker Richard Piku. And the ever-present Mike Anderson made it stand up. LSU ended Auburn's title hopes by a score of 17 to 9. The following week in Birmingham, the Tigers ran the ball a staggering 62 times, dominating the Crimson Tide. Linebacker Lewis Cassio's interception sealed a 20 to 15 victory. Charlie McClendon defeated his former coach, Bear Bryant, for the second year in a row. 
the season-ending victory over Ole Miss was even more gratifying. Archie Manning, who had frustrated Tiger Championship hopes for two straight years, was ineffective, playing with a cast on his left arm. Tommy Casanova nearly beat the Rebs all by himself with an interception and two punt returns for touchdowns. When Ron Este caught Archie Manning in the south end zone for a safety, Tiger fans realized the route was on. Final score, LSU 61, Ole Miss 17. The Tigers were once again champions of the SEC. This south end zone has been the scene of some of the greatest defensive struggles in all of college football. In fact, some people say that LSU defenses treat this small piece of real estate, boy, it's almost like a piece of sacred turf. Such was the case when Notre Dame traveled to Baton Rouge in 1971. The entire state was in a tizzy over this return matchup of a year ago. When it was over, the Irish wished they had never left South Bend. Tommy Casanova defended that south end zone as if his life depended on it. Linebacker Warren Capone seemed to be everywhere. Three goal line stands by the Bandits totally frustrated the Irish. On offense, LSU fans witnessed the emergence of Burt Jones. In the first quarter, he found his cousin Andy Hamilton with two completions and a touchdown. The Tigers never looked back and scored a resounding 28-8 victory in the friendly confines of Death Valley. One of the great traditions in LSU football is a tough, stingy defense. But well, another great tradition is one that changes this place from Tiger Stadium to Death Valley. It's nighttime football in Baton Rouge. It's a documented fact that LSU plays better at night. Perhaps it's a little Bayou magic. Or simply, it gives the fans all day to get ready. By watching this party, you think that LSU fans invented tailgating. The atmosphere they create both inside and surrounding Tiger Stadium is unique in college football. They have created an experience for LSU players that is unforgettable. There's no experience like playing in Tiger Stadium. Uh, and I wish every, every LSU fan could do it. There's nothing like running through the, the Golden Band with uh, screaming Tiger fans, it's just no experience like it. And uh, every great Tiger fan, I wish they could have that experience. One of the things that I hear all around the league is about coming to playing in Tiger State. Everybody fears coming in. They think LSU is probably one of the hardest places to come in and play. To get a win is just very, it's, it's very tough to do. In 1972, the Tigers played their most memorable night game since the Halloween magic of Billy Cannon. And Ole Miss would be the victim once again. The Tigers had the nation's best quarterback in Burt Jones. Still, late in the fourth quarter, LSU trailed by six. Jones drove the Bengals down the field, battling both the Rebels and the clock. And finally, with four seconds left, he threw for the end zone, but the pass fell incomplete. Ole Miss thought the game was over, but incredibly, there was still one tick left on the clock. Jones went to the sidelines to confer with Coach Charlie Mack. Uh, it was an exciting time. Neither one of us were conversing a whole lot at that point. I think our nerves had probably come to a fra fragile end at that point, but uh, we just knew what we had to do, and we went back in and did it. 
is at the 10-yard line, Ole Miss territory. Here is the game over. Jones back to throw, looking for a receiver. He has Davis. It is good for the touchdown on the last play of the game. Brad Davis gets the bird goes fast. He's a corner of the end zone. And pandemonium breaks loose in Tiger Stadium as the Tigers eke out a 17-16 victory over the Ole Miss Rebels. After the game, you could drive into Mississippi and see signs that read, set your clocks back four seconds. You're leaving Louisiana and coming into Mississippi. LSU enjoyed many tremendous wins with Charlie McClendon at the helm. But in his last year of coaching, he would endure what he called the worst call he ever saw in football, and it would cost the team a huge win. It came against Southern Cal in 1979. The Trojans were ranked number one, but a touchdown pass from Steve Ensminger to Leroy Jones had the Tigers up 12 to three at the half. Sparked by Heisman Trophy winner Charles White, the Trojans came back and cut the lead to 12 to 10. LSU had apparently held on to win when they stopped USC on this play, but there was a flag down. To the dismay of the Tiger fans, the officials called a face mask on LSU, and with new life, the Trojans went on to win 17 to 12. That is a tough one. This was one, probably we shouldn't have been on the same football team with them. They had a good football team. But that night, we were as good as they were. And I think this is what was so disappointing that we felt like we outplayed USC that night. And not only did I see my players cry, but their coach cried as well because they gave everything they had. They had nothing left. But, you know, we felt like we got a real tough call in our own stadium, in Tiger Stadium, but it could have been the difference in the ball game. In Charlie McClendon's last year as head coach at LSU, his team went seven and five and captured still another bowl victory. But it's all said and done, he is now the winningest head coach in LSU football history. He is indeed a Golden Tiger. In 1982, under coach Jerry Stovall, LSU had an impressive offensive arsenal featuring quarterback Alan Risher and running backs Dalton Hilliard and Gary James. Perhaps the biggest win of the year was a 20 to 10 romp over Alabama at Legion Field, the first win over Bama since 1970. The Tigers out-hustled and out-hit the Tide for all 60 minutes. It was a pounding like Bear Bryant had seldom seen. And after the game, he made a point of saying that directly to Coach Stovall. He said, uh, Jerry, that's the, uh, that's the best blankety-blank uh, blank -blank kicking that we've gotten in a long time here at Alabama. And, I said, Coach, do you mind if I share that with my team? And he said, well, I, I'll come into your locker room and tell them myself. And I said, no, sir, if you don't mind, I'd rather tell them. So he did, I told the kids, I said, look, you, I'm fixing to give you the highest compliment I think you can get from perhaps the greatest coach that will ever coach this game has just said you did a marvelous job. And uh, that, that's a compliment to the assistant coaches and to our players. Have Coach Bryant say that about them, I thought was perhaps the best thing that could possibly happen to them. Two weeks later, the Bold Scouts descended on Baton Rouge for the showdown between Florida State and LSU. Games with the Seminoles tend to be exciting, and this one was no exception. With Saturday night magic in the air, the Tigers struck quickly with a touchdown pass to Dalton Hillier.
Already, the oranges were flying as LSU would earn a bid to the Orange Bowl with a victory this night. Just before halftime, Eric Martin and the Bengals broke the game wide open. With the fog rolling in off the bayou and the Tigers scoring touchdown after touchdown, the second half turned into a 55 to 21 blowout. It was a night never to be forgotten. Chancellor Warden, on behalf of the Orange Bowl Committee, it's my extreme pleasure to extend to you on behalf of this great university, LSU, an invitation to play the Big 8 champion in the Orange Bowl on January 1st. Nineteen eighty two turned out to be the most rewarding year in Jerry Stovall's coaching career, earning him National Coach of the Year honors. Two years later, LSU was under the direction of Bill Arnsbart, who took the Tigers back to the top of the SEC standings. Arnsbarger's greatest talent was getting the most out of his Tigers in hostile environments against the giants of college football. In 1984, he took his team to the Los Angeles Coliseum to meet Southern Cal. Led by quarterback Jeff Wickersham, the Bengals knocked off the Trojans on their home turf 23-3. That same year at a soggy Legion field, the Tigers battled Alabama. Thanks to the running of Dalton Hilliard and a blocked punt by Michael Brooks, the Tigers drowned the Crimson Tide 16-14. In 1985, the Tigers traveled to South Bend for another showdown with Notre Dame. This time, LSU embarrassed the Irish at home, defeating Notre Dame 10-7 on a cold winter day in Indiana. Motion, Woodside going to the far side. Murray back to throw. Three-man rush. He's got a lot of time. He's bound by Carl Wilson. Back at the 37-yard line. In 1986, the SEC was perhaps the most powerful conference in America. LSU would be its most dominant team. Four weeks into the year, it appeared the Tigers were on the right track. 28-17 victory at Gainesville was a tremendous confidence builder. A week later, Georgia fell 23-14 and the Tigers were undefeated in the conference. Still, the team who wins in November is the team that will win it all. On November the 8th, the Tigers traveled to Birmingham to face off with Alabama. It was an old-fashioned test of character in the SEC. In the end, it was Alabama that flinched. Puts it out there and it is touchdown! across the back of the end zone, and Hudson found it. The Tigers scored an emotional 14-10 victory that put them just one win away from the SEC title.
A week later, LSU made it look easy, defeating Mississippi State 47 to nothing. The SEC title was assured. There was still the matter of Notre Dame. On November the 22nd, the Tigers were playing for the pride of LSU and the conference in the final meeting in a series with Notre Dame that had begun in 1970. It was another nail biter, complete with a classic goal line stand at the south end zone. Rolls himself, pitches out. LSU prevailed 21-19. In 1988, the Tigers would win their second SEC title in three years. The game that set the stage for their dramatic championship run took place early in the year under the spell of the night sky in Death Valley. You know, the excitement of football can take on many different forms. There's the exhilaration of a high-scoring offensive game or the tension of a close defensive struggle. Well, such was the case in 1988 as Auburn came to town to take on LSU. SEC title hopes on the line. And on that evening, the heat and humidity had a lot in common with the stifling defenses that both teams were playing. Auburn had denied LSU a point all night long. Well, LSU had yielded only a pair of field goals. With time running out in the game, the purple and gold mounted a drive to destiny. Hudson back to throw under pressure, has his tight end, Halliburton. Can he get the first down? He can! LSU moved to the Auburn 10-yard line, but a pass into the end zone on third down fell incomplete. This nail-biter had come down to a final do-or-die play. With the cool of a riverboat gambler, Tommy Hodson brought the team to the line. 1.47 to go in the game. LSU wins or loses on this play, it would appear. With David Browndyke's conversion, LSU had won 7-6. The eruption that ensued in the stadium literally shook the earth, causing tremors that were picked up in LSU's geology department. A lot of schools can brag about their brand of football, but where else can fans and athletes alike cause such a commotion that the earth actually moves? Games in 1991 and 92 saw the Tigers roar again as LSU began a rebuilding process. In 1991, a late fumble on the goal line caused by Ricardo Washington against Vanderbilt at a 76-yard return by Wayne Williams gave new head coach Curly Haldman his first victory in Death Valley. A stunning 24-3 upset of Mississippi State a year later, sparked by an emotional LSU defense, was reminiscent of the traits that had led to greatness for teams from Doc Fenton to Billy Cannon and Burt Jones. For years to come, LSU fans will continue to savor these golden moments in Tigerland. College football in the 1990s bears little resemblance to the game of 100 years ago. But the young men who follow in these heroes' footsteps share a common goal, a desire to be the best, to play with honor and courage, and to bring credit and glory to LSU. LSU.